Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Uh, I also recognize that this is a holiday Juneteenth. I just want to acknowledge that um, I mistakenly scheduled two of our webinars on <laughs> Monday holidays. So lesson learned for next time, but really appreciate you all joining tonight. So um, I want to just introduce myself for those that have not joined any of our past webinars. My name is Hannah Greenberg, and I'm an Associate Environmental Services Specialist on the City of San Jose's Climate Smart team. A little bit of background on Climate Smart. It was, uh, it's the City of San Jose's Climate Action Framework, and it was passed back in 2018. It outlines strategies for the City of San Jose to address climate change and to create a healthier living environment. The city recently set ambitious targets for achieving net zero emissions by establishing the pathway to carbon neutrality by 2030, which means that by 2030, the city hopes to just to sequester, aka remove as many emissions as it produces. And one strategy that would help us to achieve these goals is to switch from gas to electric in all of our homes. So we've partnered with electrification expert Sean Armstrong of Redwood Energy to put on a series of webinars on home electrification. And Sean will talk a little bit more about his background and his work in just a few moments. But first, I wanted to cover some housekeeping rules. So just a reminder that the webinar is being recorded. I believe you all should have received some sort of notification when you signed in, but just wanted to put that reminder out there. Um, and this is a Zoom webinar. So we have it so that there is no chat function, but there is a Q&A, as Sean mentioned at the beginning. It's at the should be at the bottom of your screen in that bar that has a bunch of icons. It says Q&A and it has two chat bubbles. So feel free to add your comments, questions in there, and we'll answer them throughout the webinar. No need to wait until the end. Um, and you can also raise your hand if you'd like, and that would notify us that you want to ask a question vocally or verbally, uh, and we'd be happy to unmute you. So you and Sean or whoever else can chat um, to get your questions answered. And I think that that's it on my end. So yeah, again, thank you all so, so much for attending and thank you to those that have attended our past webinars as well. Um, this is the last one in this home electrification series with Sean and it's been really, really great. We've gotten so many great questions um, and a lot of input just on the topic and the material. So I just wanna thank you all and thank Sean. Um, and with that said, I will pass the mic over to Sean. Oh, thank you, Hannah. It's been lovely. I really appreciate you putting these on. You guys are doing that job of being a leadership city because um, no other city is hiring us to do this at all. You are awesome. So uh, we're gonna, tonight we're gonna talk about upgrading your electrical needs in your house, your, your services, your various appliances, et cetera, without upsizing your actual panel um, and the service that comes to your house. So I mentioned that on the left-hand side, this is a free online resource that Menlo Spark funded. And we, we host on our website as a free download for folks, pocket guide to all electric retrofits, single family homes, and go to redwoodenergy.net. On the right-hand side, you can find on Redwood Energy's YouTube site. So if you type in Redwood Energy into YouTube, we have just tons and tons of resources and you'd be looking for our presentation on power efficiency, the power efficiency calculator. So briefly, um, I have been studying this topic, how to get renewable energy into homes since 1995. Electrification has become the answer. You know, at the time when I was studying in college, there was also like, uh, we would make electricity with our legs. <laughs> and we had all these pedal powered appliances in the house and computers and TVs and the rest of it. Um, went on to be a science teacher briefly, but discovered that I really enjoyed putting the solar panels up on the roof of the school more than uh, the experience of dealing with administration. So I went into affordable housing and started a, a company within the Danco group called Danco Communities as a project manager and went out and got grant, grant funds that were available because zero net energy and solar power had become goals of the California and federal government starting in 2006. So just hit the you know the right time, weren't at the right time there. So got into the industry and ran with it and have done about 400 all electric apartment complexes now, just lots. Um, so that's been since 2011. I've been consulting as, as one of our nation's leading consultants on all electric, 100% solar powered buildings. And my favorite project right now, this darling, is 500 apartments 
um, about half for low-income seniors, half for uh, moderate income families. And it has a nine story tall solar wall facing the Washington DC beltway, as well as canopies up on the roof. And uh, let's just get a whole bunch of bells and whistles. <clears throat> okay, so tonight, our topic of, of electrifying our homes without increasing the power lines to our homes. Uh, hold on for a sec, I'm giving a presentation. Do you need something? Okay. Sorry, child care moment there. Um, so we're here in California, most of us, I assume, and certainly city of San Jose is, and we're at 8% of our existing construction is all electric. Like pretty much Michigan and New York are as bad as us, maybe Maine, but the rest of the country is ahead. So we're digging ourselves out of a hole that we dug ourselves into with policy starting oh, oh, at the, we're going strong with pro-electrification policy up until the 1973 OPEC oil embargo and it was uh, really hammered in by the um, Iran hostage uh, crisis of 1979. Both of those led to huge oil shocks in our country and California ever since has been anti-electrification followed up with the 2000 energy crisis, which was a gas supply scam. Nonetheless, the history has been is that our state with all of its regulatory authority has been swimming in the opposite direction of the tide, which has been towards all electric construction. Um, Florida note is 77%, Hawaii is 72%. So the problem that we're facing in California is somewhat unique to California. Not only other states have a similar problem, but Lots of our country's already been built all electric. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District has accelerated the time frame for us to think about this. San Jose, you can see, is in the, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And then California Air Resources Board as well um, has been announcing their goals. But here in San Jose, in 2027, you'll not be able to replace a broken gas water heater with a new gas water heater you'll be replacing it with a heat pump water heater. And that rule gets implemented statewide, I think in 2030. So a few years later, maybe a year, maybe 2029. Um, for space heating systems, it's 2029 in San Jose and the rest of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And that's based upon the smog that you experience. Um, California still has the dirtiest air in our country. And so, uh, the back of a mud is able to regulate smog through NOx and the state has regulatory authority over greenhouse gas pollution. And uh, unfortunately it's a slower timeline. But San Jose, you heard from Hannah, is, is performing leadership work on this. 2030 is where we're getting with, with San Jose. Just note that we're not at all alone. All over Europe, they've been passing laws similar to ours. Um, gas boilers are used for space heating and water heating predominantly, like two thirds of buildings in most European countries. It's different in every country, but most countries predominantly use gas boilers for both space heating and water heating, and then frequently don't have air conditioning. So these are all countries that have banned um, gas boilers. Now, this question of electrifying things, like saying, hey, no more of the gas burning, not for the smog, not for the climate change, no more. How do we do that without causing grid problems or personal house problems? Now, I'm going to pause here because Bala or Bela uh, asks, does making a service upgrade require changing all the breakers since they may be old? I'll answer that and say no. You can get a service upgrade without changing all the breakers, but usually your breaker panel would be 100 amps if you had a 100 amp service, so to have spaces about for 100 amp uh, worth of stuff. So if you get a on a 200 amp service, you're probably gonna replace the panel so you have spaces, but you don't have to. There are other strategies, but like basically the answer is yes, a service upgrade is probably gonna make it so that you replace all your circuit breakers too. Um, and then it goes on to say also, should the property need to go through full electrical inspection and wiring? No, no, not necessarily. Like, uh, most homes have perfectly fine wiring now. I think that it's nice to go through such an inspection, but not at all necessary. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, 
this is the service upgrade. This is what we're talking about. This blue wire, the blue stuff, the utility is paying for that through the rate payer funds. So truly you pay for it, but just in that diffuse way, like with taxes, but that is paid for by the utility. They'll give you a new thicker copper wire, but you pay for all the red parts. And so we conducted a, a big study for PG&E in San Diego Gas and Electric. And we, we contacted 300 electricians. We did tons of interviews. We got tons of billing and pricing, et cetera. And we, it came down to this uh, take home. The red parts are what you pay for if you get a service upgrade, the new thicker wire being a service wire. So it's a thicker wire. But when that thicker wire comes in, you're gonna replace or not, but you're likely gonna have to touch all the red stuff. Um, so that costs a range between two and a half thousand and thirty thousand uh, dollars. We like got a hold of about fifty different people who had service upgrades, and it delays the project, the electrification of your house by a minimum of two months, um, and then up to eighteen months is what we found. And unexpected costs and unexpected delays happen more than half the time, according to our surveys of of uh, homeowners. So you are more likely than not in for a wild ride of unexpected costs and delays, which is why we're gonna to try to avoid that because we don't have time for that. Now, when did homes get enough power to go all electric? That 100 amp standard, that starts not 1947, because from 1947 to 1969, that's when it was 60 amps, which is a lot of power. I'm gonna show you that actually 60 amps is more than enough for most homes already, but, 100 amps, definitely gold standard, and it took place in 1962 as a result of a nationwide effort. I'm gonna discuss in just a second. Um, I see a bunch of questions over here. Bruce, you're saying, you're told that the aluminum wire needs to be replaced with copper, in my case, as part of the solar panel install for the permits. If you have aluminum wire, that's quite old, and that's not safe, that's true. It's also rare, aluminum wire, I've only heard of being in um, like 1960 era, like manufactured trailer homes. And if that's what you have, okay, yes. Uh, trailer homes are built to a very um, lesser standard than permanent homes. They're, they are designed to be sort of transitional, eventually thrown away homes. So they have aluminum wiring if they're old and you should get rid of that. And Bruce, Bruce just said that his place was built in 1997. With aluminum wire? Okay, I'm gonna let Tom handle that. He's electrical engineer. Um, Daniel Schaefer, you said, can I take my home off the grid if I have a solar and battery? Yes, um, it can require a significant amount of solar and battery to handle the, the darkest parts of winter. Um, but yeah, um, Bela, you ask, who bears the cost if the wiring is underground, including digging and concrete repairs? Good question. Um, the wiring underground is usually the cost of the homeowner. So you have to dig the trench and you have to lay the wire. And that is expensive. That is an example of like a $15,000 to $30,000 job. And the concrete repairs are also the the responsibility of the homeowner. So like if you have to dig through the sidewalk and trench through the sidewalk and do some repair, that is uh, considered homeowner expenses. So it's not rate-based, you get to, it's expensive. Um, actually gonna re revisit that with SMUD in just a moment. And Randy, you asked, just ask, how many homes with existing 100 amp panels have I totally electrified? Like me personally, adding solar, which needs panel space and including at least one EV charger. Uh, well, like my house, um, there's a number of houses that are case studies, but I don't consult to houses, I consult to apartments. So Tom Cabot here, he actually works on single family homes and he should speak to that. Um, just cause my apologies, but honestly I do affordable housing. Steve Schmidt, you ask, what if several neighbors upgrade their panels and pg &E has to upgrade the transformer on the poles? Who pays for that? Good question. Um, generally, it is the homeowners. If there is a transformer service, uh, that it, like the transformer bucket, transformer is upgraded because people are asking for it. It's generally made to be shared by um, the homeowner or home, homeowners 
that triggered it. That's how it generally goes. And it is one of those significant expenses. I have that whole study that I could show you when those examples happen, Steve, and I could send that to you because it's quite extensive. And it's also up on our website um, of all the different issues of who pays what. We have like nice graphs of it and examples of pricing. Okay, but moving on to this, um, that the, this 1962 code that didn't happen by accident, the utilities, about 1900 of them organized around this for the entire 1950s. They started a number one television show on Sunday nights, hosted by none other than Ronald Reagan, of, and he called it the Ronald Reagan General Electric Theater. And Ronald Reagan then was put on trains to travel the country and open up every nuclear power plant until 1963, when he quit to go into politics. During that period of time, this this TV show on Sunday nights would have like every star, Rita Moreno and James Dean and Sammy Davis Jr. and Judy Garland and the people who played Frankenstein and, you know, and Bella Lugosi of Dracula, like everyone, everyone. Uh, Donald Reagan had personally discovered, quote unquote, um, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, he, he was quite a, a mover and shaker in Hollywood at the time. And this was his mansion. They created a demonstration mansion to try to show what it would take to make an all electric home. And you can still watch little YouTube clips of him touring his all electric mansion for, on behalf of essentially all these utilities. You say like, how do I know though 100 amps is enough? Because I studied it. Lots of studies now. I'm gonna show you a couple. pg e here, um, this is 22,000 homes. And I think that Steve Schmidt, you did this work. And what you can see here is that the average peak is in the, the range of 30 amps, which is what old trailer homes would have. And manufactured homes, about 50 amps. You can see that really the majority now, quite a bit more than majority, is already peaking over the course of an entire year. They're peaking at less than 50 amps. And so, and you have apartments, which are around like 70 to 80 amps usually is what they get delivered. Houses are required to have 100 amps since 1962. And California houses, 200 amps since 2016 to allow for more space for solar rays. I'm going to go into a couple of strategies to avoid or to add a lot more solar while avoiding. But basically, the stats are 98% of the households of these 22,442 have less than 88 amps at peak over the course of an entire year. And that's what these 100 amp services are designed for is the, the hottest, the, the, the moment in which you'd make the wire hottest. Now here is a fun example because it compares all electric and gas homes. Gas hybrid homes are in blue and you see they're peaking around like 23, 24 amps. And then these all electric homes, many of them with electric resistance, water heating or space heating or both, they're peaking around 32, 33 amps. So about 10 amps more and maybe 40% more total power. Now, this is a larger peak. And people point out like, don't all electric homes have larger peaks? But I did just also mention that this peak is a result of electric resistance, water heating and space heating. And I'm gonna show you how to avoid that. Um, but generally you can see that this sample and SMUD, everyone, all electric and gas, they were pretty much completely out of trying to even use power around 80 or so amps out of the 100. So it, it conforms with the PG&E data shows us, which is that almost nobody uses more than 100 amps. Every once in a while, yes, but almost nobody. And I'm gonna show you strategies to make sure that you are part of that uh, nobody. Like, no. <laughs> um, okay, so Bruce England, you said, isn't that the guy who yanked solar panels off the White House after Carter? Ha <laughs> ha, yes, he did that in 1987. Some people thought that Ronald Reagan did it the first thing he got in. No, he actually waited until most of the way through his second term. Randy Bruling, you say, what are the characteristics of the houses of the, nine, of the 98%? Did they have electric furnaces and electric water heaters? And it's unknown. This is a mixture of homes, which is why I really like this graph because it shows all electric homes. And granted, they have inefficient electric products. These are older existing homes. They're probably electrified in the 60s and 70s and then stopped probably you know, by the 1980s. So these are older houses that are all electric. Um, and then Daniel Schaefer, you say, if I'm gonna use an EV, that pretty much means I need to replace my 100 amp service. Not at all. I'm gonna show you smart EV chargers, a whole bunch of them later on. 
So what did uh, 35 electricians say were the most common reasons they performed a service upgrade? So this is part of our big study for PG&E and NV5. And this is the number of times that it was brought up by these 35 electricians. Like seven of them said an EV charger was a reason they did a service upgrade, like a brand new thicker wire to your house and all the thousands of dollars and all of the downstream, like the panel and all that stuff. This is what electricians sell to make more money. None of them study the question of how to do less work for you. So this is a unique presentation that you're getting, just so you appreciate that. I'm giving you all the insights that electricians could have if they studied the question of how not to charge you $20,000 and start charge you $600. <laughs> Put in a few more circuits. Don't replace everything. Um, so EV chargers, that's a reason. Solar, HVAC. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So the heating and cooling system for the house. Uh, they said just age of the house, the pool, or a hot tub. Uh, load calculations, accessory dwelling units, and that legitimately might require new service, but that's pretty much it on all this list. So I'm gonna show you strategies, and it's kind of fun. I'm gonna show you some strategies that are high-end because high-end owners had access to the best stuff sooner. Big loads like this entire hotel's three swimming pools in the summer and two hot tubs. I think there's more hot tubs, but at least two hot tubs. And in the winter time, they keep just two hot tubs and one swimming pool steaming hot. So this is a bunch of money. And they, they, what they did is they cut the bills in half because spending propane, like burning all that gas to keep this luxury amenity going hot in the winter time in upstate New York for this ski resort, they were doing it anyway. But when they put in heat pumps, they cut their bills in half. And of course, they got clean energy out of the deal. Um, now, this, what you're seeing here, I'm sorry, closing things. For, on the left-hand side, this is a computer-assisted heat pump. They're also called inverters. These are, you know how there's like 10 different words for one thing? This is one of those examples. Okay, so it's an, it, there's a computer inside called an inverter. And what the computer does is it spins the system faster or slower, depending upon the temperature outside, collecting heat from the air. And there's like a fan and a condenser in there. They're working together faster or slower. So what they do is they heat up the water in the swimming pool with an air source heat pump, getting the heat out of the air to like 80, 85 degrees. And then they take extra heat from it and they stick it in the hot tubs to make them 105, 110. And the whole system is designed to work that way so that all three of them get heated. But it's a, uh, sorry, a water source heat pump. So it's collecting heat from the swimming pool and putting it into the hot tubs. And this lowered their bills in half. So this kind of strategy, which comes out in 2011, early for computer assisted heat pumps, is just a great one because um, it shows why uh, luxury devices frequently get these really significant investments in them. So yachts, yachts are smelly with all the gas they have to burn. This is a no smell yacht. Yachts are noisy because they have big churning diesel engines down there. This has batteries and it makes no sound at all. This is uh, the brand is Silent Yachts and this is the Silent 120, their biggest, but they make silent 60 foot yachts that are two stories and silent 80 foot yachts that are two stories, and this is a three-story, 120 square foot, uh, well, 120 foot length and like 6,000 square foot, three-story yacht. And it, it's basically like a small apartment complex with this huge kitchen in it that's like most of a floor and hot tubs. And it comes with um, a submarine, comes with a small airplane that you saw there. This is like the graphic version, but, and it comes with uh, these electric jet skis. These all sort of come out of side compartments. And all these things are using 90 plus efficient percent, uh, 90 percent efficient or better motors. A gas motor is in the range of like 20 to 30 percent efficient at turning its energy into actual things getting done. The gas has energy, how much work gets done. So electric devices are way more efficient, usually three or four times as efficient. And they're powering off these super efficient solar panels. These are premium, highest power density solar panels. And they're running these into the super efficient lithium ion batteries that are downstairs. And they're heating this hot tub on the back with a heat pump, not electric resistance, of course. So this whole thing has got sort of 
the nicest heat pumps, the, the nicest, most power dense batteries. And this is the stuff that is being um, adopted further downstream economically. This is the reality. But right now, I and mean, you can get on these jet skis, you can go in this submarine, they're silent. This airplane here, this is a little bit more of an experiment. I have less confidence they're gonna sell these yachts with real airplanes. They say they're going to in 2024, we'll see. But you know, there's amazing things have been happening with um, battery assisted uh, drones, essentially these, these devices that are you know, mostly AI. Now, for people like us, or maybe you're not like us. I don't know where you are in the economic strata, but people like me, how about that? <laughs> so I have this condensing washer dryer. It is a 120 volt device, which means it plugs into any of the outlets in your house. So you don't have to rewire. I have this and I got rid of my electric resistance dryer that I had there. And I can use that now for a level two charger. I'll show you that later. But the point is, is that this is a washer and dryer it is awesome. It washes and dries my laundry. Things come on the other side, you know, crispy, dry, love it. Then here I have this. This is a, a heat pump water heater that doesn't have electric resistance backup. So instead of being 4,500 watts and 240 volt, this is 500 watts and 120 volt. And you can plug it in anywhere. And this provides just as much hot water in the first hour, which is like 72 to 80 gallons. And the water is um, essentially stored like a little battery. It's stored hotter at 140 degrees Fahrenheit and then delivered at 120. That's what this black uh, extra thing here is for, is mixing the water to um, 120. Then here, this is a heat pump that um, I've been putting in apartment complexes for years now. People love them, tenants love them, they're silent. They sit on the wall and they plug into a 120 volt outlet next to it. And they can do 12,000 BTUs of heating and cooling uh, an hour, which is one ton. And uh, so those of you who are into that thing, you, you need two or three of these in most homes. And you could put one in every bedroom and one in the living room for a sort of optimum comfort because everyone would have their own controls and such. And that would hypothetically overcool or overheat your house if all of them are running at the same time, but most people just turn it down whatever temperature they want. So that's how we do it with apartments. Every bedroom gets their own Innova HPAC 2.0 and we can, don't have to do any fancy wiring. Then here, um, this, is a, this is my stove. I have a two burner induction range. It goes up to 1800 watts, power balances between the two. So it can be boiling on one and frying on another and use all 1800 watts. And then this is the Oster extra large um, countertop oven. So it's big enough for a turkey, obviously a couple of pizzas and such. And this is a 120 volt. Um, so 1800 watts for the induction range and then uh, 900 watts for the oven. And that is how my, I cook for like a family of five. It's not a big deal. I actually have one more of these two burners in a different part of the kitchen. Like I said, two cooking stations. Because every once in a while I want to cook on like three or four burners. These I've been hiring, I've been, <laughs> I've been buying, pardon me, for my staff. Like um, Maria, she, she has a baby. She's down in Los Angeles. There's a whole bunch of people who live in the house. It's East LA and it's hot. And this is a computer assisted, which you see here in the language, it says Medio Duo, 14,000 BTU, 12,000 BTU SAC, which means essentially it does one ton of work, 12,000 BTUs when it's properly rated. Um, and it says smart, high efficiency inverter, ultra quiet, portable air conditioner. That's a mouthful, but the inverter is what makes it ultra quiet. It's got a computer in it and it runs, maybe it sounds about half as loud as most of these products are um that don't have computers so this is only 700 dollars and this here this one ton h pack this you purchase this for like three and a half thousand dollars and do some installation to plug it in it's fancy and nice and it goes negative five fahrenheit this only goes to maybe 25 fahrenheit but it does heat in the winter time um, and my coworker, um, he put one in for his whole house, 1500 square foot house. He got two of them to be exact, but two of them are enough for his 1500 square foot house this last two winters in a row. Now, Daniel, you asked, Daniel Schaefer, you asked, why didn't you choose a tankless water heater? So this water heater, this 500 watt, if I was getting a tankless water heater, it'd be about 15,000 watts. 
14,000, maybe 12,000, but it'd be this huge number trying to heat all the water that's needed in the moment it's needed. That takes lots and lots of power. This heats water slowly and raises it to a very hot temperature, 140, and then holds on to it. Um, it's just like sort of saving its pennies for a rainy day kind of thing. Every once in a while, you're gonna want a whole bunch of hot water and it's got it all saved up for you. So um, that's the reason, because we don't want to, um, if we have 100 amps and we put in a 60 amp um, electric resistance instantaneous water heater, then we don't really have a whole lot of room for other things, do we? <laughs> um, and Randy, you said, if you want to replace a ducted gas furnace with a ducted heat pump, can you do that on 100 amp panel? Absolutely. It'll take you between 20 amps and 30 amps of your 100 and that more than enough is there. And Daniel, you say, your daughter says her tankless water heater never runs out of hot water. That is how they're designed. That's a success. However, this heat pump water heater will run out of hot water after eight showers in a row. So how often does that happen? <laughs> I mean, if that's an issue, then maybe you need to put in the 60 amps, but um, most people would put in an 80 gallon heat pump water heater, which would be enough more for like 10 showers in a row. Um, or like six or seven if people are really showering a long time. So this is, this is the, the goal is to make a house that doesn't have to go through the 100 amp service upgrade. And that does mean there's less choices, I'm not denying it, but you know, that, that's the talk that we're having tonight. Other people have a different talk on a different night. Uh, people all the time actually give talks on how to do all electric homes requiring a 100 to now 200 amp service upgrade. That talk is available everywhere. Okay, so I was showing out here how like a computer assisted uh, heat pump can lower bills and make it quieter and make it run in the winter time. Now check out these, these are all computer assisted. Well, I'll take that back. These are different efficiencies of heat pumps available in the United States. The lowest number, which is 8.2 for the heating seasonal performance factor, HSPF. That's the lowest that you can put in legally. And 14, that's SEER. You probably know that number better, but it's the air conditioning one. So seasonal energy efficiency rating, SEER, that's for air conditioning. So these two go together, 8.2 HSPF, SEER 14. That's the least efficient device you're allowed to install in our country. It's a national standard. Okay, and then you get like a ducted heat pump. This is low efficiency, the middle efficiency, commonly found, you can get it all over the place, is a 10 HSPF and an 18. Now that happens to be the minimum efficiency that you're allowed to install and get rebates through um, the Inflation Reduction Act. If you're like a low or moderate income household, it has to be a SEER 18, which goes with a SEER or the HSPF 10, sometimes it's nine and a half, but just call it 10. All right, and then you can get better ducted, 11, 13, you know, 13 pairs up with a 24, maybe even a 26. You get to for 14 HSPF, which is, you know, 60% or better, more efficient than the lowest. That you have to go to duck list currently. And that gets you up to like a 33.1. And that's a single system, like one ton of a heat pump. So it's not like multiple heads. This is just the most efficient. And I lied. Here's the really most efficient. It's just come out from Carrier. Carrier's got this SEER 42, HSPF 15. I wanna remind you, the least efficiency you can put in is a SEER 14, and this is a 42. So that's one third as much energy being used by this one ton heat pump. And HSPF 15, that means that this is roughly half as much space heating energy in the winter. Maybe it's not quite, it's like maybe 60% or something, 55%. It's almost half as much. So one third as much air conditioning. And this, by the way, is really important to think about the grid. I wanna go back here and think of, and show you how, when you're taking one of these gas hybrid homes, which has its peak because of air conditioning, that's the peak that's going on. This electrical peak is an air conditioning peak. And you put in a super efficient space heating system, like an HSPF 10 or better, you're already now lowering the peak in the house, the air conditioning peak. And this is what SMUD has seen, is that putting in decent heat pumps for space heating has lowered their summer peak. That's awesome, these higher efficiency systems. 
are reducing their actual crisis. And a lot of people think, oh, can the grid handle electrifying? Yeah, <laughs> it actually kind of needs us to electrify because that means we put in much more efficient air conditioners and stop causing our summer problems. Um, now, some people want to point out, but what about efficiency? Efficiency definitely has a role to play. Now, if your house is uninsulated, there's no insulation in your walls. You should insulate it with anything you can, at least R4, which is one inch. Once you get past R4 in California, except in the mountains, then you'd spend your money more wisely next making your house airtight. So going from the leakage that you have right now, which is in black here, where you might have a peak load of say 50,000 BTUs in the winter time at negative five, let's go to California temperatures, like 20 degrees, 30 degrees. In black is your leaky house. In orange is the lowering of the heat load. And on the right-hand side, you can see how when you lower the heat load, on the right-hand side, you see how you also lower the running amps, the amount of power that's demanded. So less air leakage means less heat pump has to run. So that, there is a significant savings there of going around the cock gun of like reducing the amount of heat pump you have to put in the power that you demand by like a third. That's a big savings in power demand, which is the point of this talk, all right? John, we have a few questions and comments in the chat. Okay. So Randy, you said, Randy Bruling, you said, what do you suggest people do that have kitchens with existing things? Like, oh, that question disappeared. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, Shauna, um, I just completed a type answer, but you may want <clears throat> to address it. It's in the answered questions. Oh, I see. Um, well, I'll go to the next one because, you know, Michael says, I live in a condo and want to replace my gas water heater with a 120 volt heat pump water heater so they don't need to do electrical work. That's smart. The current gas water heater is located in a closet in the living space and has an outlet. Do I need special drainage or venting installed? You need both. So it's gonna have condensate drain out of it. You um, want to hook that up to a sewer line, like if there's a nearby dishwasher or a nearby washing machine or a nearby sink, you're gonna to wanna to run a pipe from this water heater to that so that it drips water into the sewer line. The second thing you're going to want to do for venting is that you want that door to be a vented door. You could literally cut a hole in a door, but there's vented doors out there, just like louvered, screened, that kind of thing, doors for cabinets and such. The third thing you want to do is put it on a vibration pad so that when you have this inside the residence, it doesn't shake anything because it's basically like, like what you do for a dryer, a laundry dryer. Kind of treat it like it's about as noisy as that and do the same thing the vibration pad doors that close in this case it needs to still have air be able to pull into it so you want to put a vent on the door at least one vent but ideally two vents on the door make the whole door like a louvered door um randy your point that the most ex the most impactful thing that people can do is get their homes uh new windows and re-insulated but that's expensive and I'd say that it is a high impact thing to do, but we study this really carefully and you can get a lot more efficiency out of one of these heat pumps, like lowering the, the heating load in the wintertime by half or more, but about a half is what you can do with, um, with a high efficiency heat pump. And you can lower waste heating by half by also sealing duct work. That's not insulating, that's, that's air tightness that we're talking about so like tightening things but insulating will not get you a lowered energy demand by half until you almost super insulate so I've really intensely study this question and i'm making these recommendations like the heat pumps are really important air tightness is really important other things are important but this is the stuff that's the fastest most cost effective keeps you under 100 amps so just, this is a fun story. Um, this is what's going on for people. During the summer months, Maria, she's like, Maria, she can, um, her apartment turns into an oven. She's up in Portland. She can barely breathe. This is a case study that we found, uh, just got posted online. And she got a heat pump response program, free heat pump installed so that she could air condition her place during the summer so she wouldn't die. If you're paying attention, um, heat waves across the world are killing people. There's, 
more than 100 people have just died in India in the last couple of days from 110, 120 degree temperatures. So she says, hey, it cools the whole apartment. It feels very cold. So she used to be scared of the large bills she'd get from her electric resistance heater. So this will cut her bills by about two thirds going to a heat pump compared to her electric resistance that she had. And she'd been putting on sweaters, blankets, and using open flame gas cylinders to try to just do a little bit of spot heating in her place because people frequently only need one room to, to be warm enough for them to survive, kind of. But she didn't realize how much more efficient heat pumps are and having a, a fan coil on each wall. These are ductless mini splits going in so people can just heat one room, allows them when they're poor to uh, at least keep one room comfortable without having to threaten their health with carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide and all the rest of it that comes with open flames. So, um, Michael, you wanted to know about the drainage for heat pump water heater and you said, can you drain it into a bucket that you empty manually? Yes. Uh, if you had a building code official inspect that, they'd probably fail it. But 90 to 95% of heat pump water heaters are not installed with the building permit like all other water heaters. It's almost not done. So, in that context, granted, I am speaking on behalf of the city of San Jose, you should definitely go get a building permit for safety. And you should think about what it means for the next person who owns your house in a decade or 30 years or whenever that happens to have to replace the water manually or someone who takes care of you. Like if you get sick someday, you know, like will your daughter or your son come in and also know to drain the bucket? So I'd say it's not a great solution, but yes, it would work. So here are the two products that are essentially available right now. On the left-hand side, this is 40 to 80 gallons. It says 50 down here, and that's a typo. It should say 40, 50 gallons, also 65 gallons and 80 gallons. So this um, plugs into the wall, any outlet, totally code uh, safe. It's 900 watts is the maximum it'll pull, but usually it's 500 watts. Same thing with here on the right. This product here, this Sanco 2, this is for an entirely different bathing experience. Yes, it uses less than 900 watts, 900 watts, 400, 300, whatever. It uses a small amount of wattage, but less than 900, so it can plug in anywhere. But it's, well, I should say, it needs a 240 volt line. That's the one difference is that this one does require a new circuit be run. And this is designed um, with a special refrigerant, carbon dioxide, that heats water not up to 140, but 150. And then it mixes it down to safe 120. This is what you want. The one on the right is if you have one of those big eggshell bathtubs, if you have a 12 person household, if you, um, we use one of these for like up to 10 apartments, if they're single studio apartments. And I have two different tiny house developments of seven studio tiny houses, each one served just by one of these tanks. So I wanna be clear that this is for a much larger demand. Now they're designed over in Japan for sitting tubs. So you can fill a 150 gallon sitting tub and keep it hot all night. So that's what this product does. And they're here for sale in the United States. They just cost four times as much, more or less. So they also do four times as much water heating, literally. So it's like a, so it's very linear, the relationship between the heating of water it does and its cost. This is my daughter exploring my new um, water vapor fireplace when it just came out of the box at Christmas time. I had it up with my little tiny house Christmas tree here. And she was just stunned that she could stick her hand into the fire. <laughs> so it's 120 volt. Um, it comes with a heater, 500 watt heater. You can heat up the room with it. Also have a, you know, a true fireplace experience. And there's an ultrasound element in there that makes water vapor. It's a theater effect, like old fashioned. People have been doing this for decades use an ultrasound to make really thick fog come off the stage. Well, and then light it up so it looks cool. This is just a tiny one, has no sound. It's ultrasound, so you can't hear it, including little kids, dogs, et cetera. This is way too high. And it just vibrates water into a mist and then it has a bright light bulbs to make it look like fire. And you know, a little fake log, light, fiberglass fake log set. This is what they cost, the Dimplex, Optimist. Dimplex makes lots of different electric stoves and they're the only ones who make a, like a residential for sale online uh, ultrasound one. So they're in the, the sub brand Optimist. Optimist, and you can make them like big fire boxes or 
long ones for fancy houses. Like it's anything from little to big and you can decorate them and they sell them sometimes with fake rock facades. It's, it's a thing. Anyway, they're the best fake fireplaces for um, most people. However, a fire water um, makes their own custom for you. So if you've got like a higher end situation, you want something that changes lots of different colors. So you can have a, a rainbow pride parade on one day and you can celebrate the Green Bay Packers winning on a different day. And it's like a Hogwarts fireplace. Um, a fire water, all one word makes those. Now, Randy, you're asking, when are we gonna get to examples of electrification home in San Jose? Is San Jose Climate Smart going to collect information like this as the city works towards its BACWA mandates kicking in? Um, I am not giving any examples of San Jose houses tonight. My bad. I really was focusing on the strategy as opposed to houses of any type, um, but there's lots of them. I just didn't think of that. Now, let's see here. Um, Bruce England, you say, or you ask, pardon me, does insulation need to be replaced or refreshed now and then to keep efficiency up? Ye yes, it would be good to top it off, so to speak. Um, so, and, and adding more is good. It doesn't, most insulation doesn't lose very much loft over time, um, but instead insulation gets attacked by rodents most frequently up in attics. And that can be kind of, well, that's why you add insulation on top. Going up there and removing insulation is kind of a hazmat job for real. And so really the best thing to do is leave it in place and insulate over on top of it and put out some, put out mice traps. Um, Jeff Perone, you say, I can't remember the name, but I know there's a system that was recently developed in the Bay Area that uses hot water as an energy battery. What do you think of those systems? Um, well, a hot, th there's the hot water energy battery that's like the ream I just showed you. Um, and IntelliHot just came out with a CO2 boiler that's using propylene glycols, thermal storage. And I think it's brilliant. It's a, like a super cheap battery specifically for hot water. Strategies like raising it to 140 Fahrenheit or like adding uh, some gooey propylene glycol or some salts in there and like these little storage media to make thermal batteries. It's a great idea. Um, let's see. Now, 120 volt cooking here. So I mentioned that these two burners out there, this is a Ducks Top brand. Um, I really like Chef Top, it's 130 bucks. Um, the Oster Extra Large, um, 120 volt induction walks, of course, like clay cookers for rices and beans and things like that. And it's nice to get um, new pans. People are often, often kind of reluctant to go get a new pan, but it's not like you, induction pans need to have something stick to a magnet in order for them to work. So the um, cast iron pans and stainless steel pans both work. If you have a glass pot, it doesn't work. You'd have to get like a little metal plate to put underneath it or spend 20 bucks and get a new nice pot. Spend 50 bucks and get a really nice one. This is what it looks like to replace your stove. There's the gas stove on the left. You can get like a $1,200 uh, Whirlpool induction range. You can get a $600 uh, smooth top, like glass top electric resistance range. Those are nice. Those go into all of our rentals. Inductions, you know, three or four times as fast, faster than gas. It, um, gas, like these burners are 6,000 BTU burners but they're only getting the gas energy into the food at about 25% efficient. Whereas these inductions are like 80 to 90% efficient. So they actually heat faster than gas flames do. And if you're looking for more like the fancy, here we have the big chill, which is like a $6,000 antique looking induction range for people who've got some, some, uh, some class, you know, they wanna get a big chill. Um, let's see, Barbara, you asked, does the Sandin make smaller electric heat pump water heaters? Are there other brands besides Sandin that use CO2? And unfortunately the answer is no and no. Sandin only makes their big one, which is this compressor. And they have tanks from 40 gallons up to like 120 gallons, but it's always the same compressor, which is the, the thing that costs money. And uh, there are other brands that use CO2, not at the residential scale yet. Lots of people are talking about doing it, but no one's done it. And certainly people have been asking for years. 
Um, but this heat pump water here on the left is almost as good. So that's how it is. Um, Jerry, you asked, do induction cooktops scratch easily? Uh, they have very hard glass, just like glass top stoves do. And I'm just looking over at mine here. And I've got one that's about a year old and has no scratches on it at all. I'm, I'm like, I don't, I'm not special on it, but they don't, they don't seem to scratch. Um, and Randy, you ask, aren't you going to need a 40 amp for that Whirlpool induction range? Yes, but interesting is that 40 amps, when you put it onto a house, is derated by 60%, meaning that instead of it looking like 40 amps on your panel, it looks like 16 amps. That's the rules for at least one way for doing it. Um, another way is say that you had studied your panel and it was, you peaked at 25 amps. Okay, so then you're gonna add a little buffer. So now it's 30 amps and you can add something that's at full rated. So 40 amps is a stove. So 30 plus 40 is 70. And you still haven't gone over the 100 amp threshold in either of the two ways that are code approved to add this 40 amps. Regardless, uh, the answer is that your 100 amp panel is big enough for a 40 amp stove. And 40 amp stoves can be paired and frequently are with um, EV chargers that are super fast EV chargers. I'll show you that in a sec. Okay, just when I'm cooking, here's the barbecues that go outside. This is nice because a lot of apartments don't allow gas barbecues, but they'll allow electric barbecues and they won't allow like charcoal barbecues. They don't want to open flames. These are no open flame barbecues. Here are electric 120 volt, low power, in other words, power efficient, I should say, uh, dryers from the left. This is a heat pump dryer. So it's the most efficient. And this is four cubic feet, which is big enough for a family. It's not big enough for like gigantic dog beds or such, but you know, if you don't have weird stuff, then it's just fine. Um, I have a 4.5 cubic foot and like I said, lots of kids and lots of bedding and all the rest of it, it does it all just fine. Then in the middle here, this is the really big electric resistance. So it has vents. It's like you'd plug it in where you have a vented electric dryer now, but it's 120 volt. So it's gonna take like at least twice as long, if not three times as long, <laughs> but, it's just 120 volt. And on the right hand side, similarly, and, uh, and low power, like it's power efficient. This is a condensing all in one washer dryer, the one that I have and I love. And it also takes like two and a half times as long to dry. But I love it because it washes and then immediately starts to dry. And so I never forget. It's always just dry when I come back to the machine. It just means I can do like practically two to three loads in a day. But I'm not sure if that'd be a whole lot different if I was both washing and drying a bunch of loads in a day. Certainly in my history, I've never succeeded in getting more than a few loads done. So I don't think you lose much time, if any, you might actually gain time. Here are smart splitters. So from left to right, like the NeoCharge California product, you can plug your stove and your dryer or your stove and your EV charger or your dryer and your water heater, et cetera into the two plugs and it's basically like um, uh, a plug strip. These are all essentially like 120 volt plug strips but for 240 volt devices. So that you can have one big power thing like the water heater and have that sharing the same outlet and the same circuit and the same power demand as far as your panel is concerned with some other high power device. So you get two for the price of one. And so you have a, like um, the dryer buddy here this is designed with cars in mind. And so the dryer runs and turns off the car charger. And when the, the dryer is done running after an hour, the car charger turns back on. And that's your dryer buddy. And similar thing with NeoCharge, similar thing with Simple Switch, Split Bolt, they all have timers and they're aware of what other power demands are happening so that they can share. And that's, that's at um, like a low level. I'm gonna, this is the first level. And I'm gonna show you a couple more examples of that. And this is how it looks sort of visually. On the left-hand side, that's an electric resistance, 30 amp, 240 volt dryer, standard electric resistance dryer. On the right-hand side, this is a level two charger, a 30 amp level two charger gets 30 miles per hour fast of charging. You know, 30 miles is what the average commute is back and forth in a day. So essentially in one hour, you get your whole commute done. 
And then in the middle, these are um, heat pump and condensing uh, dryers. And you can see how you could just plug those in into any outlet and they're fine. And then share one outlet between the electric resistance dryer and an EV charger or some other thing. You probably wouldn't have two dryers, but maybe you do, I don't know. Anyway, but the point is that these are different strategies. You can share or you can do power efficiency or both. Um, Daniel, you're saying the biggest problem with induction ranges are the size of the coils. Most of them will only heat 50% of a 12 inch cast iron skillet. So you're saying six inches and you should be getting eight inches, like good induction ranges that have eight inch coils. And the biggest coils out there are 11 and a half inches, just so you know. It's really hard to find the actual size of the induction coil. And it's hard to get one that can heat a really large skillet cost without it costing quite a bit more. I agree. I feel like induction stoves are not properly labeled right now to tell you how big the coil is. And that's really annoying to me. Um, so I will um, go out there and I'll search specifically for eight inch coil. I'll use that as my search engine when I'm, when I'm researching stoves so that I can get either one of those countertop ones that has an eight inch coil or permanent big ones. Um, so that's, that's kind of the story, especially at the, like the $1,200 induction ranges. Once you start getting up into $2,000 to $3,000, those fancier ones that have like a really big circle and those are like the eight inch or nine inch coils. Mm. Jeff, right, Harvest Thermal is the one you were thinking of. You're right, and Harvest Thermal is using the sand in um, for homes that have very small space heating needs like one ton space heating needs plus a little bit of domestic hot water because that's only a ton and a quarter of total hot water heating it can do at a time. And also doing thermal storage. So they're, they're a great product. Um, Jeff, you wanna know if they're like power strips and why are they so expensive? Smart isn't that expensive. Yeah, good question. Um, these things like the dryer buddy's 200 bucks. The split bolt, that's 319. Some of these kind of less well-known brands are reflect perhaps, um, well, the pricing reflects the fact they're less well-known, uh, but the dryer buddy was there before, like this sort of slicker product, NeoCharge has a computer in it, et cetera, and they're 500 bucks. And I know these folks, just like I know these folks over at Simple Switch, and they are in the business of trying to make money. So they think that this $500 device is cheaper than say $600 or more of hassle that you'd have for putting in another 240 volt line. And so they're purposely pricing it close to what they think its value is. Not an accident. Okay, so I showed you the, the pan, like these are the smart device that can split two things at once. Now here is the more expensive, like this is $3,500, but this is sub panel. You can plug lots of things into this. And so if you have like in your main panel, a 20 amp circuit breaker, you can plug the lumen into that 20 amp circuit breaker and it can support six other 20 amp circuits on that one 20 amp circuit breaker. So this is a device that allows you to add up to about 300 amps worth of stuff potentially to your 100 amp panel with smart controls. So it'll turn off the EV charger if it's taking too much power for the house, it'll turn off for 15 minutes or half an hour. And it'll do that according to your instructions, like what things you want to have turned off if, if under the very, very rare occasion, you actually go over hundred amps, which I showed you earlier is really hard to do, even for all electric homes. <laughs> um, then here on the left, the span panel, uh, I think it's out of San Diego and the genius panel, which is out of Canada. Um, these are both very smart whole house panels for 100 amp replacements that can support 400 amps of loads, which is almost impossible to figure out how to plug in 400 amps of stuff. It's just so many things. Here are load flexible EV chargers. So they can sense how much power is available and ask for less. And then when there's more power available in the house, they can speed up and they can charge faster. Isn't that nice? And they, they can also like balance two cars, like the EV duty over here, you can have two vehicles that are being powered at the same time and they're just, one of them might fill up before the other. And then when that first one fills up, the other one gets all the power and gets faster. And so over the course of the night, you can get things all charged up. Daniel Schaefer, you said, I've heard span panels are very expensive. 
uh, span panels themselves cost like $4,500. Installing them, yes. You know, you usually pay for anything three times what the thing costs to get it installed. That is, uh, there's a bunch of rules for why that works, but it's usually 3X. And you're, you're working with a low cost contractor who gives you only 2X, you know, two times as much. So you wouldn't expect this to install for less than nine grand in most cases because of markup, labor, profit, and overhead. So then, then for solar arrays, you saw at the top how solar arrays frequently trigger larger services. That's because technically on a panel, you're not supposed to put more than 16% of power back into it. So you have a 100 amp panel, that means 16 amps is what you're allowed to put in through is AC electricity. Up on the roof, that equates to a 3.8 kilowatt solar array AC after it's been converted from DC. So 3.6, 3.9, pardon me, um, KW, 3.9, 3.8, no, 3.8 <laughs> is uh, smaller than the average solar array in California, which is about four and a half kilowatts. It's close. So most homes could do it because you know averages are composed of smaller amounts, people with three to three and a half kilowatt arrays. But if you want to put in um, a lot, in this case, this option, the connect connector, and DER stands for distributed energy resource, so they're being kind of punny. So it's a plug and play. You basically pop off your, your meter and you put this device here, a connector, and that's where you plug in your solar. So it takes just a few minutes. It requires no special tools. They're really proud of that. And what it does is it takes your 100 amp service and it makes it function like a 300 amp service for the purposes of solar connection. Meaning instead of putting 16 amps into your, your panel, now you can put up to 50 in, in through the meter connection. So if there's 16 amps on a 100 amp service and you can do 50 amps with a connector, that's about 300 technically like 312, 300, call it that. <laughs> so it's about three times as much. Um, and so that is a, an inexpensive, easy thing to do so that you're not limited by, you don't have to do a service upgrade because of the solar array, like those electricians said you did. And you're like, well, that's cool. What about this option? This is a different strategy. This is a clipping inverter. In the springtime, you can see how um, the California grid clips solar. And a lot of people get kind of concerned about that. And I want to show you how this works in the real world. So this inverter over on the left-hand side, what it does is it allows you to plug in up to about 15 kW kilowatts when or you can only technically put 3.8 kilowatts of AC into your panel. But you can connect 15 amps with this inverter. That's pretty overkill, but hypothetically, that's what this does. Now, over here on the right-hand side, this is a real house. Now, they're producing with a 7.6 kW of solar array. In November, they're saying we produced 5.82 kilowatt hours in a day with this 7.6 kW solar array. But we put in a clipping inverter. And now in the wintertime in November, a year later, we have a 10.6 kilowatt solar array. And see how it's still not over to the spot of clipping. So they're able to get more wintertime production. Isn't that great? Now, this is that 10.6 kilowatt array, and it's capped at 10 kW of power that it can put in. That's the clipping at 10 kW, but it has 10.6. So in this example, they're losing about 8.87, so call it 9%. They're losing 9% of the power of that day, but they're gaining in the rest of the year. So in this case, they have 40% more solar was installed with a clipping inverter. They installed 40% more. So from 7.6 up to 10.6, that's 40% more. And then they got 33% more energy and they, that's in the summertime, spring and summer. And they got 39% more energy in the wintertime. So this, pretty modest amount of clipping, really only 6% is getting clipped off. Well, 10.6 kW is being clipped at 10. But this is the theory behind it, is that you start getting more power for more of the day and more seasons when you do a clipping inverter and that it can be cost effective. 
to put more solar panels up on the roof. And instead of having a 3.8 kilowatt system, maybe you have a five kilowatt system. And you clipped off some of it, but it made sense in the fall and the winter and the spring and not as much in the summer. And overall that worked out for you. So these are the last couple slides here. If you've been holding on this long, <clears throat> thanks for y'all. Um, here are whole panels on the left-hand side, lovely illustrations um, by the Josie Gaylord and Courtney Bayer worked on these. So in blue are all the things that you're not gonna change, you're not gonna touch. These are code minimum light plug circuits and garbage disposal and refrigerator and dishwasher and clothes washer. So you just leave them alone, nothing to be done there. In green, this is a forced air heat pump, which has a, um, a power efficient, likely um, blower. It's like a 120 volt blower. And you'll find them in that booklet, this booklet here I'm showing you that has a whole chunk on the blowers that you'd install for a heat pump that aren't 240 volt, just 120 volt up there. So you don't have to do any rewiring. Then you'd put in an efficient heat pump. So this is a 20 amp, this has a computer in it. If it doesn't have a computer, it'll probably be a 30 amp product. So this is a 20 amp though. Then the EV charger, this is at 20 amps and that can do um, about 19 miles of charging an hour. I charge at home about four miles an hour and that keeps me going almost the entire year, never with a problem, but that, I'm me. So anyway, this is 19 miles of charging. <clears throat> Then you see here, this is the 16 amps with the solar input there. So I just gave you the whole talk about how you could get you know, 5.9 kW with that, um, with that inverter. Then the heat pump dryer you have, which is a lower power device I showed you before. This is 14 amps out of the 20 amp circuit there. And you count the 14. And keep in mind, these things also get multiplied by 0.4 the coincidence factor. So they don't actually show as 40 amps on your service because the assumption is they're only on, according to code, about 40% of the time. So they get derated by coincidence factor. So that they're only 40% of the values you see here. So this stove I mentioned earlier is 40 amps, but it looks like 16 amps on your panel. And then here's the heat pump water heater. Um, and this is a sort of a medium power one not even the lowest ones I just showed you. And here, that's a 2,000 square foot house. It's on less than 100 amps. Here's the 3,000 square foot house. Ignore the blue stuff. Now we have a ductless heat pump system because um, ducts take a lot of energy to blow air through ductwork, it takes its own amount of power and you can get really efficient ductless heat pumps. So we put in a ductless one in this example, still using 20 amps, still have, whoopsie, the 16 amps for input because it's a 100 amp panel. We didn't use the solar collar in either of these examples, but we could have. Then over on the right hand side, we have those circuit sharing plugs. This is just a simple one, like the simple switch or the Neo Charge or the dryer buddy in this case. So it's balancing the resistance dryer with a heat pump water heater. And these are both full power devices, uh, no efficiency about them. There's just the, they're sharing the power. And the same thing here with the range and a really fast EV charger. This EV charger um, can do 38 miles in an hour as a level two charger. It's at the sort of top of what you call level two. So this is how you do it. Diane Bailey, you asked, can virtual panels be added to expand capacity without utility approval or are they treated like a panel upgrade? And my understanding is that they're treated like a panel upgrade, not like a service upgrade. They are still inside of them a 100 amp circuit breaker panel with some computer controls, but for fire protection purposes, they are just like the, the panel that was replacing, that they're replacing. They have devices that are metal inside that heat up if there's too much electricity running through and shuts things off, but there's an overlay of computers. But at the end of the day, it's just a circuit breaker panel that you'd normally get approved through the city of San Jose, not through a utility. Okay, I just wanna remind you of the resources, particularly um, the one here on the left, this very current one for our conversation. But there's also lots of, if you're building a new house, this is a little bit more of a new house focused book. And um, this is now time for more questions. If you got more questions. And a reminder, if folks want to talk, feel free to raise your hand and I can, we can unmute you. I see Randy has a question in the chat. Yeah, Randy, you say, 
Didn't you say earlier that the standard panel for a new home in California is 200 amps? Yes, I did say that. It is the 2016 Energy Code. And the 2016 Energy Code, which starts on January 1st, 2017, why would they do that? I don't know, but it always starts the first day of the following year. So uh, the 2016 Energy Code, it required that single family homes and low rise apartments for new construction had to have solar um, enough that the tenants would get it and certainly enough in a house you know, for the homeowners to get it. And that meant that they, um, they wanted for a new house basically to be able to have up to 7.6 kW on a 200 amp panel without any tricks. So that's when it happened is 2016 to accommodate up to 7.6 kW AC, which is significantly larger than the average installed array, which is usually around, like I said, four and, four and a half. And you asked, why are they putting those in if 100 amps is enough? In 2016, they weren't really thinking about power efficiency. They just at a technical level, I mean, you are in a very innovative talk. You know, um, the San Jose chased me down as a, a technical expert in how to do this. Tom Cabot, who's here on the line, he's a technical expert in how to do this. We spent years studying it. And we teach all other sorts of people. I present to other utilities. I present an NREL, Rocky Mountain Institute. This stuff is, is a, a new way of approaching it. The old way, the sort of emblem, emblematic of the name Rewiring America, an amazingly powerful, important organization that's promoting electrification, but they started their organization thinking that they were going to have to rewire America. And the point is that we don't have time and we don't have money. And so most houses would be well served to adopt one or more of these strategies to not go over 100 amps when they electrify. And that is kind of a new way of thinking. Um, and you say, well, how new? Well, we only published this book a year and a half ago, and we only started presenting on the topic, like, hey, this is a big deal, about two years ago? And no one else was presenting on it. We were total heretics. <laughs> we were swimming upstream um, and, and saying, no, no, we don't have to rewire America. No, no, there isn't a utility electrical grid crisis. No, no, that's not it. That's not true. We have all of this stuff that's been around for a long time <laughs> that's here and available and can do these jobs. And so, um, yeah, that's what's, what's shifted is that uh, I think that Tom Cabot here, who he and I, um, and along with some electricians who've helped us think about this and a whole bunch of my staff over the years who've contributed bits and pieces, um, we've all as a team tried to, to figure out how to give a presentation like this how to walk you through the subcategory of devices that would keep you from having to go over 100 amps, be it load flexible panels or power strips or devices that are low power inherent to their design or all these things. And also really researching the code because I think a lot of what's happening is these electricians that are triggering this, they don't examine the code to solve the problem and so they just don't really know very deeply that they don't have to do this when you interview them. They're, they're kind of convinced with their general wisdom, their conventional practices that, that service upgrades are necessary. And it's clearly true that it's not necessary. Okay, and Rand, you say, Hannah, you guys should have all the elected city council members in San Jose watch these webinars. We agree. You know what's weird though, is that city council members who are elected don't think they have to do whatever staff tells them, probably because it's the exact reverse. <laughs> and staff are the employees of the city council. <laughs> anyway, they go on to say, they need to know what's going on, agreed. Especially in the context of back when mandates. Absolutely, those are really driving the ship these days, which have not been well publicized in the media. Agreed, they, they're basically just this spring and, and I think we, we chatted about this before in a different presentation that, that you're right, that these need to be um, put in front of more decision makers. Hopefully, hopefully, Randy, now that you are educated on the topic, you should run for city council or talk with someone who is there. Educate them. Why aren't they here? Um, are there any other questions, though? Let's see here. Um, looks like, Tom, you're just monstering through all these good questions here. Um, 
Well, if anyone has any questions, put it in the open category, like any questions you didn't feel got it answered. Okay, well, um, it's evening and I will say good night and go have some dinner then. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good.